Hi folks, couple of demos here to do with all things electric and magnetic. I have a big magnet here and I have a piece of wire and that piece of wire is connected to this meter. There's no battery, there's no power supply, there's no nothing and that meter is reading zero. Zero is in the middle. You see that? It's a centre zero meter. And all I've done is connect the wire from one terminal on that meter to the other one. Now, if I take my magnet and I put the wire, if I just put the wire in between there, then there's no reading on that meter. But if you look very, very carefully, what happens if I move that wire? And I might need to zoom in a wee bit here. I'm going to move the wire out the field, in the field. Let's zoom in on that little pointer. Into the field, out the field. This time, I'm going to use two bits of wire. Move it into the field, out the field, in the field, out the field. You see the wee reading on the meter? In, out, in, out. I'm going to try three loops of wire. Coil it around three times. I've now made a very simple coil. Let's look at this reading. So I'm going to move it into the field, out the field, into the field, out the field. Let's zoom in on that little reading. In the field, out the field, in the field, out the field. I'm going to go to five loops of wire, that's the best that I can get here. But if I move that coil into that magnetic field, watch, I'm going to move it in the field, out the field, in the field, out the field. Watch the wee meter reading, and it's there. Watch the needle. In the field, out the field, in the field, out the field. A moving conductor, or a moving coil, in a stationary magnetic field, generates a voltage, an alternating voltage, it's going one way then the other, okay? that means it's alternating means it's changing direction. So a moving coil in a stationary magnetic field generates an alternating voltage. So if a coil moving in a magnetic field can generate electricity, then maybe a magnet moving in a stationary coil can generate electricity. Let's try that. Right, same idea, only this time we have a stationary coil. That coil, by the way, has got 12,000 tons of wire. And, remember, there's no battery, no battery, no power supply, no nothing. And if I get a magnet, and if I just, if I put that magnet, watch this, I'm going to put a magnet in the coil. What reading do we get? Nothing. I'm going to take the magnet out and put the magnet on top of the coil. What reading do we get? Nothing. Okay? The only time you get a reading on that meter is when you move the magnet in and out of the coil. Watch this. In. Out. In. Out. Faster movement. Bigger reading. Faster movement. Bigger reading. In, out, in, out. Movement, magnetism, electricity. Now, that magnet moving in and out of that coil, a changing magnetic field induces a changing voltage across that coil, which produces a changing current in that coil. And a current flowing in a coil produces a magnetic field. So there's a magnetic field around that coil when there's a current flowing in it. And that magnetic field interacts with the magnetic field of the permanent magnet. We're best showing you this with a different demonstration. Hi everybody. I've got a wee hollow tube here copper tube and two wee masses right you'll see that one that one's got wee yellow ends on it 
That one there. That one's got no wee yellow ends on it, but they're pretty similar. Yeah? One of them's magnetic. Not that one, no. Not the one with the yellow ends. It's made of aluminium. It's not, it's not attracted to that little coin. Whereas that one is. Right? So, wee magnet. Not a wee magnet. Copper tube. Empty copper tube. I'm going to drop that one down. Watching. This is the one that's not a magnet. Hup. Straight through. Again. Just drop it through. So you can see me. Here it goes. Hup. Straight through. This is the magnet. Now the copper's not magnetic. There's no sticking to it. But watch. Drop it in. Takes a couple of seconds. Again. Up. In fact, I can keep it in there. Drop it. Turn it. See it? There's no friction in there. Isn't that amazing? What's that all about? And we're talking about inductors. What is an inductor? Well, an inductor is a coil of wire. That's it. That's all it is. Need a pen. And the symbol for a coil of wire is just like that. If it's a coil that's got nothing inside it, that's the symbol. If it's a coil and it's got maybe an iron core inside it, you know, maybe see a wee line across the top, iron core. So there's a coil, an air coil, an air core. And when you put a coil in a circuit and you turn it on, then a, a current will flow, but it's a wee bit more subtle than that. Something else going on. And before we talk about that, let's talk about this. Right? You see that? Okay. Yeah. When you move a magnet in a coil of wire, it produces a voltage. Right? Come on, have a wee bit. If you just place the magnet in the field, if you put the magnet in the field and you leave it stationary, you get nothing. But if you move a magnet in a coil of wire, the changing magnetic field produces a changing voltage or a changing EMF, we should say, electromotive force. When you move the magnet in, the needle moves one way. When you pull the magnet out, the needle moves the other way. So the direction of the EMF depends on the direction of the changing magnetic field. When you move that magnet into that field, a current flows in that coil. And when a current flows in a coil, the coil becomes magnetic, an electromagnet. And that goes some way to explain what happens in this, this little apparatus here. When you place that magnet in that copper tube, there's a changing magnetic field going down that tube. That changing magnetic field produces a current in that tube in a circle around that tube and that current makes that copper an electromagnet and it produces a magnetic field that repels that magnet or opposes its movement watch it goes drop it in it doesn't just accelerate down at 9.8 there's a reluctance to its motion there's something opposing its motion and what's opposing its motion is the magnetic field that's produced by the little current that's induced, They're called eddy currents. It's the currents that are induced in the copper by the changing magnetic field of the magnet moving through the coil, moving through the conductor. Now, if we go over here, 
change in magnetic field causes an EMF. If we put that switch on, if you turn that switch on, then the current in that circuit will change and it wants to change infinitely quickly from being off to being on. And a change in current will produce a changing magnetic field and a magnetic field will grow around that coil. And a changing magnetic field produces an EMF. And that EMF opposes the change that's causing it. So when a magnetic field grows around a coil when you turn it on, it produces a voltage that's in the opposite direction, produces an EMF that's in the opposite direction to the EMF that's producing it. It's called a back EMF. So when that magnetic field grows around that coil, it induces an EMF in the coil that's in the opposite direction to that EMF. So there's an EMF, if you like, in that direction where we're trying to push a current in that direction. And as a result, there is opposition to the rate of change of current. The current is not going to instantly turn on. It will take a wee while for that current to reach a maximum value. In fact, if you were to sketch a graph of what would happen to the current when you turn it on, a simple DC circuit that's got an inductor in it, and the current tries to instantly reach a maximum, maximum value of the current, but the change in magnetic field induces a voltage that opposes that change that's causing it. And what that means is we get a graph that looks like this. The gradient of that graph is the rate of change of current with respect to time. And that gradient is at a maximum right at the start. That gradient then decreases, 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 decreases until the current reaches its maximum value. So as soon as you turn that on, the rate of change of current is at a maximum. So the growth, the change in magnetic field is at a maximum. So the induced EMF is at a maximum. The opposition to that forward EMF is at a maximum. But then as you oppose the rate of change of current, as the rate of change of current decreases, the back EMF decreases and the circuit stabilises with a constant current where there's no change in current anymore, there's no change in magnetic field anymore, and the circuit just behaves like a normal resistive circuit. What happens when we open the switch though? If we then open that switch, what happens to that magnetic field? That magnetic field will very quickly collapse and the magnetic field will change. A change in magnetic field induces a, an EMF. So therefore, as soon as you turn that circuit off, that collapsing magnetic field will produce an EMF that keeps that current flowing until the field has collapsed. So, when you open the switch, you're going to end up with a current graph that's going to look like this. The coil, the core, the inductor tries to hold on to the current. It opposes the change that's causing it. It doesn't want the current to change, so it sustains the current and the current falls to zero. And here's the last thing. That might only be a very small voltage. That might only be 6 volt battery or whatever. When you open that switch, that magnetic field will collapse instantly. And therefore, you get a huge induced EMF. And that huge induced EMF can be much, much, much bigger than 6 volts. It can be hundreds of volts. That's why it's always very dangerous to turn off something that's got a big coil in it because as that magnetic field collapses, 
then the EMF that's produced from that changing magnetic field, the EMF that's produced can be in hundreds or even thousands of volts and you can get a shock from it. That's why it's dangerous to turn off something like an amplifier, a guitar amplifier. You should turn it off before you turn the volume down. Get the current down to zero before you uh, turn it off. It will stop a large back EMF and prevent you from damaging the equipment. Right, so much for the demos. Here's the stuff you really need to know then. Inductors. An inductor is a component that has got similar properties to a capacitor in terms of it can store energy and it reacts to different frequencies in an AC circuit. There's a wee inductor there. That inductor's got an iron core in it. An inductor's basically a coil of wire with negligible resistance and it uses the growth and the collapse of decay of a magnetic field in its operation. And there's the symbol for an inductor or a coil. If it's got a wee bar above it, that means it's got an iron core running through the middle of it. If a magnet's moved in and out of a coil of wire, which we've showed you plenty of times, an alternating EMF, a voltage, is induced in the coil. And the size of that voltage depends on the size of the coil and whether or not it's got a core in it, the strength of the magnet that you're moving in and out of that coil, and the rate of change of the motion of the magnet, or the rate of change in the magnetic field. So there you go, that was Faraday's very simple demonstration. If you move a magnet in and out of a coil, then an EMF is produced. Now that induced voltage doesn't require any external power supply and therefore it's called the self-inductance of the coil. It's the coil that is producing that voltage itself by the action of a changing magnetic field. Now when you put an inductor or a coil in a DC circuit, then when you turn the current on, the sudden change in current produces a change in magnetic field around the coil that changing magnetic field induces an EMF across the coil that opposes the change in the current that causes it. That EMF is in the opposite direction to the battery that's producing the current. And this induced EMF in a coil always opposes the change that causes it. And this is called Lenz's Law. The induced EMF is called a back EMF because it's in the opposite direction to the forward EMF that's producing the current. There's the graph of current that you get. And if you turn on a DC circuit, then the current gradually grows till it reaches its maximum value. Initially then, when the current is switched on, there's a large rate of change of current, which is the gradient of this graph because it's I on the y-axis and T on the x-axis. d high by dt is the gradient of the graph. That gradient's at a maximum right at the beginning. This causes a large changing magnetic field around the inductor which in turn induces a large back EMF across the, the coil. So this large rate of change of current causes a large change in magnetic field around the inductor which in turn induces a large back EMF across the coil. And that back EMF slows the rate of change of current because it's opposing the current, it's going to slow the rate of change of current, which in turn causes the back EMF to decrease. So the graph shows the gradient di by dt, and that gradient will decrease to zero as the back EMF decreases to zero. So if your current's no longer changing, you're no longer getting a back EMF, so there's no longer any opposition to the forward EMF, so eventually your current will reach its maximum value. And note, at the instant of switch on, the back EMF is at its maximum and is equal and opposite to the forward voltage. So the growth and decay graphs of current in an inductor in a DC circuit are very similar to the charge and discharge graphs of voltage for a capacitor. So when it's switched on, it takes time for the current to reach its maximum value. And similarly, when you switch it off, it takes time for the current to fall to zero. There's opposition to the current reaching its maximum and opposition to the current decreasing to zero. The inductance of an inductor. 
The inductance of an inductor is the ratio then of the induced back EMF to the rate of change of current that's causing that back EMF. And there's the relationship that's on your relationship sheet. It would probably make more sense if we wrote it as the ratio. So the inductance L, and L is the symbol that we use for the inductance of an inductor, is the ratio of the EMF, that's that curly E, to the rate of change of current. Now, rate of change of current is always shown as di by dt inside brackets because it's a single number. We don't have to do any calculus. Don't worry about the calculus notation that's used there. di by dt, the rate of change of current, will be a single number. So there's your back EMF. There's your rate of change of current. There's your inductance. And inductance is measured in henries. There's a minus sign in that relationship because the back EMF is in the opposite direction to the forward voltage that produces the current. Now the unit of inductance is the Henry. Now Henry is the, was an American guy, Joseph Henry. He's really America's answer to Michael Faraday. But one Henry then is equal to, if you look at the relationship on the right there, inductance. If inductance is equal to EMF over rate of change of current, It'll be volts over amps per second, which is the same as volt seconds per amp. And because volts over amps is ohms, you could say that one Henry is equal to an ohm second. That's us just messing about with units though. Inductors are measured in Henrys. The bigger the inductance, the bigger the bag EMF you will get for the same rate of change of current. Here's a wee example. This is from a past paper. If a 0.4 Henry inductor of negligible resistance is connected in a circuit as shown in figure 10 and the switch is open, and then we close the switch, sketch a graph of the current against time, giving numerical values on the current axis. So the current's going to grow up to a maximum value. What will that maximum value be? Well, we can use Ohm's law. I equals V over R is a 9 volt battery an 18 ohm resistance in the circuit. So 9 over 18 is 0 0.5 amps. 0 0.5 amps is the maximum current that we're going to get in that circuit when the current has grown to its maximum value. So there's our graph with the 0.5 amp maximum on it. We don't need to put a time on it. Explain fully the shape of the graph. Well, the large rate of change of current initially produces a back EMF which opposes the growth of the current. And part B, calculate the initial rate of change of current when the switch is closed. This is when we need a relationship that's got inductance, rate of change of current and back EMF in it. And remember the back EMF is equal to the battery voltage initially at the start. So we can use back EMF equal to 9 volts we can use the inductance of 0.4 Henry's and that will give us the rate of change of current di by dt. So di by dt equals E over minus L. Now the back EMF is in the opposite direction to the forward battery voltage. So the back EMF we put in is minus 9 over minus 0 0.4 which gives us a rate of change of current of 22.5 amps per second. Energy stored in an inductor. Well, the energy, energy stored in an inductor is stored in the magnetic field around the inductor. And that energy can be released when the field collapses and you get a large EMF produced. So similar to capacitors, where the energy stored was given by a half CV squared, the energy stored in an inductor is given by a half Li squared. And that's on your relationship sheet. Remember, that energy can be released very quickly if a large coil is switched off, which causes a large spark, which can damage your equipment or loss of data or cause an electric shock. If you turn something off very quickly, the magnetic field collapses very quickly. You get a huge back EMF. That's it.